Every scientific law or relationship, educed or inferred from scientific data, must be embedded in a theory, and theories require models for their interpretation. Those models are composed of the axioms of the scientific method, as well as logical invariants necessary for posing intelligible propositions and reaching valid inferences, and the applied branches of mathematics by which theories and propositions about their internal relations or laws are tested. When scientists use empirical methods to analyze data, those data are understood and modeled in terms of abstract mathematical properties or relations that are incorporated into scientific laws. Such relations are also the active ingredients in explanations. Since they are abstract, they are independent of observation, and we infer their presence in scientific laws from data. But the explanatory scope of scientific laws and theories are completely constrained by the observations we can distinguish in a replicable manner. Consequently, neither the scientific method nor scientific theories can ever explain how those abstract relations arise in reality, since an analysis of the relations themselves would be necessary for this, but we're going to do just that in this video. The scientific method demands local distinguishability and replicability of the propositions it attempts to falsify. Distinguishability and replicability are axioms of the scientific method, which in turn determine the testability and falsifiability of a proposition. Distinguishability requires that data points become mutually exclusive at some level of empirical resolution, enabling scientific experiment to validate the conditions under which this exclusion appears. Replicability requires that the relation or law responsible for distributing that data within reality be accessible for further experiment. But for a theory of everything, this is not possible. A theory of everything would be a theory about laws or relations that are present everywhere in reality. But this entails that the propositions about it that an empirical method tests for would be indistinguishable. There would be no conditions under which an empirical method could discern a data point contrary to such a theory of everything. Even choosing the model of best fit theory from among many contenders cannot solve this. As a result, science will never tell us what the theory of everything would be. In other words, the inability of scientific theories to achieve closure and comprehensivity is built into the scientific method. To proceed, we need a much more general theory, which must in turn be based on the most general of relations. It actually has to be general enough to encompass the whole of reality. The Reality Principle a definition of reality elementary to the CTMU states that for something to be real, it has to be contained by reality. This can be proven by contradiction, since any objection to it is self-contradictory. An objection suggested to this is often that there might be something real outside reality. Well, if this something is outside reality, then it has no real relationship with anything inside reality, whether that relationship is causal or descriptive. This makes it not real enough to affect reality, or be affected by reality, or to be described in real terms. So describing it as real is just misleading equivocation, because the person who suggests this means something different by using the word real than the meaning of bearing relationship to, or interacting within reality. If the point being made here is then missed, and it is now decided that an object outside reality can be real enough to affect reality, or that it does share a descriptive term with reality, then you've defined it in a way that makes it definitionally equivalent to objects residing inside reality. What defines reality now reflexively moves to encompass the very object you're saying is outside reality. The person who responds like this is playing a mental trick on themselves where they use the word outside to describe the hypothetical object despite imposing the same relationship onto it that defines the inside of reality. It's an equivocation of the word outside in a way that the misuse of the meaning of this word forms the substance of the reply. Calling it an unreal thing that affects reality doesn't help either and is another case of false equivocation. So these objections to the reality principle, they just defeat themselves. 
the principle to be understood here is that the attribution of a descriptive property to an object entails it as a member of a medium or domain defined by that property. But additionally, residing within a common medium entails that the objects bear a relation to one another. If you notice, the properties or attributes with which we describe objects are in fact descriptors of interaction between objects. This is regardless of whether the properties of those objects are properties they have in common or those which contrast the objects. The properties of the objects are just what you directly observe, but what is responsible for the interactions between objects is the relation which distributes those properties onto objects that share a structure or domain. This affords us with two perspectives with which to define reality one of which is in terms of set containment, which details the objects, elements or members of a mathematical set or field. A set relates to its members by a constant called containment. This will be important. Set containment is the structural or topological side of reality. This is the sense in which the domain of reality is spatial and it contains shaped objects. The other perspective, then, is the attributive, or descriptive side. This side details the organization of attributes, or properties, on their arguments, or objects. The organizing principle, referred to here, is embodied in the relations holding across reality that allow its members to interact. Now, these two perspectives, the topological and the descriptive, always accompany each other. You can take any situation or consideration and express it in terms of either. The reason why is because the containment that a set has over its elements is of the same form as the distribution of attributes onto arguments by a relation. The sameness of those two things is embodied in a duality. In the CTMU it is called attributive duality. For the sake of illustration, it also goes by the names of topological descriptive duality and state syntax duality. There'll be more on that in future videos. Now you should be able to see why, when you describe an object as real, it has to be situated inside a medium or domain containing other real objects. And you should also be able to see why an object you're calling real has to be related to the contents of reality by a real relation. The two things go together. Asserting one of the sides automatically entails the other. Anything that does not obey either of these rules violates the other and is preemptively excluded from being real or true. So to make things as clear as possible, we call reality the shared medium or consistent structure within which real objects exist. Real is a descriptive attribute of those objects by virtue of being members of the domain, reality. And a relation is a mathematical connective that orders elements or members into pairs. Thus, a real relation is any relation that performs this execution on any real object. So the reality principle reality contains all and only that which is real, can now be formulated as a descriptive attribution. We can say, for all objects within the domain reality, there is a relation between real object 1 and real object 2. Then below it is the counterfactual. For all real objects within the domain reality, no relation exists between any real and unreal pairing. What is noticeable in this formulation is that outside reality, from the topological perspective, it appears there doesn't even exist anything to be contained, which would also mean there's no relation between the real and unreal arguments. But set containment is a mathematical constant that holds over domains and subdomains, and reality is a domain. So what contains reality? and what relation relates reality itself to anything else. In mathematics, there is a concept called the universal set, wherein the containment function is the source of its own target, so that the universal set is its own subset and its own superset. 
This way, nothing is left uncontained. So, when we substitute in reality for universal set, we get there's nothing external to reality to contain reality. At reality's most general level, the only thing to be contained is its own contents, and the only thing to do the containing is itself. Reality is topologically self-contained, so by attributive duality it is also self-processing and self-relational. This now tells us what the most general relation is. Where reality is a self-contained domain, real is the attribute all of its members have, self-containment, or its dual self-processing, is the most general relation, as it spans reality and all of its contents. Now if we change our view from relational processing back to descriptive properties for a second, then we see that the act of attributing properties onto objects is actually an act of definition. So defining is attributive, and this allows us to see that self-containment is dual to self-definition. Reality defines itself, and the principle in which it defines itself is the reality principle, which is not definitionally derived from any exterior or more general relation. What this means is that reality at its most general level is self-reinforcing. If you were to somehow peel back the processive layers of reality until you reached rock bottom, or leap off of reality's pages, you wouldn't see a void, like John Trent does in the movie In the Mouth of Madness. You would see a self-contained structure, imperfectly visualized by the likes of Klein bottles, Mobius strips, or the self-drawing hands and Penrose stairs of M.C. Escher. Because the reality principle is an expression of the most general relation that could possibly exist, there is no theoretic addition science or even mathematics could make to it. It is already theoretically complete, and encloses anything that could be called reality. Now how does the reality principle determine what is real and what is not? Why would an object or subsidiary relation be included within or excluded from reality by this most general of relations? And how does the reality principle relate to the distinguishability and replicability criteria of the scientific method? The answer to these questions turns out to be the same set of relations. They are the relations referred to as binary logic, of which the reality principle itself is a general description. We can prove that binary logic exists at the level of the reality principle, as follows. The simplest general relations that show recursive self-definition and self-containment are the constants of binary logic and the logical unary operator, negation. For instance, the logical constant of disjunction, expressed as true or false, is a general relation which cannot be contained by any exterior principle. Any supposedly exterior principle would have no basis on which to assert its own truth, because the distinction between true and false comes from logical disjunction. If logical disjunction doesn't cover the principle you're proposing, then the principle isn't even true or false. It cannot be distinguished from its own negation. Logical disjunction also satisfies the criteria of self-definition, since not only does it define truth, and therefore its own truth, but it can also be expressed in terms of other logical constants like conjunction and the operator not, which in turn are defined by disjunction. So logical disjunction is derived from logical elements which are in turn defined on disjunction. It's a self-referential loop. Logical conjunction is a general relation which distributes the attribute of truth among a pair of states or propositions and is therefore responsible for mutual topological inclusion and mutual descriptive consistency. It can be expressed as true P1 and true P2 equals true. It's the logical basis of mutual inclusion. If you try to deny that it's a self-contained relation, 
you would be claiming that some other relation determines that true and true could be false in conjunction with some other proposition. But this is the same relation. So you can't claim that logical conjunction is conditional on some other relation without using conjunction itself, which is a self-contradiction. There are no means of showing your own claims to be consistent without it. It is the self-referential means by which propositions are mutually inclusive. Logical conjunction is also based on self-definition for the reason previously stated. It forms a self-proving loop with logical disjunction and negation. And that's important because we showed earlier that objections to the reality principle are also self-contradictory. So, logical disjunction and logical conjunction satisfy self-containment and self-definition, just like the reality principle does. How does the reality principle make use of these relations? Well, let's plug them into the reality principle. The self-definition of reality could be restated as follows. The domain reality would refer to the universal set of true elements, the relation would be the codefined relations of disjunction and conjunction, and the elements would be real if they are included in the set. In other words, if they exist. The self-definition then becomes, for all objects that are members of the universal set of true elements, disjunction separates elements that are true from those that are false, and conjunction allows those that are true to be mutually included. The system that the relation outlines here is an existential system. So, inclusion here means that the member is consistent with the rest of that which exists. Therefore, we have a general self-definition of reality. The universal set that provides us with a relation for how real elements are contained by reality. This relation then recursively defines what is real and what reality is. Because reality is defined on what is already real, which in turn defines its real members via the real relation. The topological descriptive duality mentioned earlier adds yet another dimension to that, which I won't go into right now. So that's regarding our generic real relations. But what about the theory part of all this? Now, a theory of everything has exact criteria. They are consistency, closure, and comprehensivity. Do the reality principle, logical disjunction, and conjunction provide these? Well, it should be obvious that logical disjunction is comprehensive because all propositions and states are either true or false. Logical conjunction is also comprehensive because all propositions are either included among or excluded from those that are true. What was proven earlier suffices to prove that they possess closure. They're both self-enclosing and there's nothing outside of them. Lastly, of course they are consistent because they literally define the separation of truth from falsehood. Consistency actually amounts to the two of them in operation and the co-definition of each in terms of the other. If a proposition is consistent, it is so because it and the propositions you're saying it is consistent with relate one another in the way that logical conjunction and disjunction would relate them. How do the binary logical constants relate to propositions? Well, propositional logic is where the definitions of those logical expressions reside. And when we're building a model, the next phase is that of predicate logic wherein statements or propositions are formulated. It is at this level that attribution takes place and at which soundness becomes a factor. So the propositions that make up our model aren't built solely out of propositional logic but exist at a predicate logic level. In predicate logic, the values of true and false are attributed to observation or potential observations and this involves mathematics. And where do theories come in? Theories are complex predicates, which make a reference to an object universe. Those predicates are related by relations, the very relations we've been talking about. 
A model of a theory is any interpretation under which all of the theory's statements are true and incorporates these various levels. If none of the statements of the theory are true, then it has zero content and also has no model. In order for the structure of a theory and its model to be constructed in a person's mind in a recursive rather than a linear way, reality fundamentally has to have an identity which is tripartite, which is actually where the name of the CTMU is derived from. But we don't have time to go over that right now. Clearly, to have a true theory of everything, the model must have a way of modeling the relations that the theory depends on which in the case of models based purely on the scientific method, they can never achieve because of the distinguishability and replicability criteria. Distinguishability is precluded by these general relations. These general relations are called tautologies, and they have to be mapped into your theory as they provide a self-reliant distinction between true and false for any complex set of predicates you formulate. These always true relations fall within a special kind of tautology that has universal closure. Reality is self-consistent, comprehensive of itself, and closed. So any theory about reality has to model those features by being those things itself. We can call them the three C's. Scientific theories don't explicitly embed tautology into their models, nor in the right way like Christopher Langan has in his model. On the topological side, in the real universe, we see these tautologies manifest as invariant interactions between objects, with boundaries, and within a shared medium. A self-consistent fabric holding everything together. Now these three C's are the hallmark, or criteria, of any theory of absolute truth. But the constants of binary logic on everything that is required to meet that criteria. As we've established, the reality principle incorporates binary logical tautologies. But there are more tautologies required for a theory of everything, including the principle of linguistic reducibility and that of syndifianesis, which Christopher Langan has discovered. Together, these tautologies compose a super-tautology, a theory of everything based on absolute truth. The CTMU is the theory that correctly models any theory, regardless of its content or degree of validity. If it has internal contradictions, the model of the CTMU will expose and resolve this. In other words, the CTMU is the theory of theories, as well as the theory of everything. In case the details got too intricate in this video, the essential point about the reality principle is that reality is its own self-definition and this comes from combining the self-containment principle with topological descriptive duality. I hope that the tediousness of this video hasn't put you off learning the CTMU in more depth. Now that the issue of binary logic has been covered in the necessary detail, future videos on CTMU concepts should be easier going. Thanks for your attention, and feel free to share your insights or objections in the comment section below.